all the world's a nail, I guess. <laughs> um, it's 702. Are, are we live, Belmont Media? We are live, yes. Okay. Given that it's 702 and we all seem to be here, I think we should get started. Um, I am uh, Roy Epstein, chair of the Belmont Select Board. Um, we, this is a joint meeting of the Select Board, the School Committee, the Warrant Committee, and the Comprehensive Capital Budget Committee. We're calling it Budget Summit 3, where the subject matter is a presentation of no override uh, budget scenarios for fiscal five, and with some discussion actually at the um, This will be presentations by uh, uh, the town administrator and also by school superintendent. Right? And if we, and we're going to stop by nine o'clock. And if the presentations and the comments or the discussion with the various committees wraps up uh, before nine o'clock, uh, I'll open it up for some public comment, but if, if we go to the end, then there won't be any public comment because we really need to end by nine o'clock. So with that, uh, I would like to call the meeting to order. Now it's um, 7.03 p.m. on December 20th, 2023. Uh, select board, I'm here. Uh, my colleagues, Elizabeth Dion are here. Uh, Mark Paolillo. Good evening. Uh, Town Administrator Patrice Garbin. Uh, Assistant Town Administrator Jennifer Hewitt. Uh, Matt Analyst. Budget Analyst. Uh, Matt Haskell, um, Budget Analyst. Wasn't sure of his title. And with that, uh, the school committee could call themselves to order and then we'll, we'll go. From Thanks, there. Roy. I'll call the school committee to order at 7.04. If the school committee could just do a roll call because we do have one member who is remote this evening, I'd appreciate it. Do you need to check away here? <laughs> Jamal Say is here. Jung Yue here. Amy Zuccarello here. Jeff Liberty here. Thanks, and Meg Moriarty here. And we are joined by Superintendent Geyser, Assistant Super um, Lucia Sullivan, and uh, Tony DiColadero, our Director of Operations and Finance. Hey, okay, thank you. Uh, next is Warren Committee, Jeff. Thank you, uh, Roy. Jeff Luby, Chair of the Warren Committee. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. I am uh, attending via online. Apologize for that. Uh, I guess in, in the room, we'll start with you, Tom. Uh, Tom Commuto, Tom Commuto, Warren Committee member. Bill Anderson, Warren Committee member. Jack Weiss. Betsy Cowing. Melissa Morley. Susan Croy. Bree Warner. Matt Taylor. Paul Richter. And who else do we have online? Okay. Yeah, Colin McGecker. Okay, thank you. And I, and uh, Jeff, I saw Ann Helgen, who's not been promoted to a panelist. She was in the participants. Yeah. I will promote her, thank you. Uh, and just for the record, uh, Roy Epstein is also here as a member of the Warrant Committee. Uh, Meg Moriarty. And also. Thank you. Okay, I am here. It's Ann Hilgen. All right, greetings, Ann. Uh, then we can move on to the Comprehensive Capital Budget Committee. Hi, Chris Doyle. I'm on the Comprehensive Capital Budget Committee to order. I think we have a quorum, but I'm not positive. Maybe, and I can't see who's online, so maybe folks can see this is kind of more happy, Chris. Thank you. Uh, folks can call themselves out. I, I'm really I'm happy. Thank you. I appreciate it. And folks, I. Dong yeah. Yue. Mark Palillo. Mark Palillo. Um, yes. Uh, Aaron Pickelangus. Chris Doyle. Do we have a fifth person? Susan was on. Susan, Susan is online. Burg yep. Susan Burgess Cox. Is there anybody else, Susan, online? Um, I don't see anybody. You don't see anybody. No. Uh, uh, no, uh, no, they're not. Thank you for showing me that. Um, yeah, so we limped across the finish line with the <laughs> Okay, very good. Uh, with that, then I guess we should start with you, Patrice. Sounds good. Okay, so Patrice will present uh, a no override uh, budget plan uh, for the town side. Okay, um, this is online. Um, it's currently, it, please. Oh, sorry. Patrice Garvin, town administrator. Um, the online, um, the presentation. 
Uh, first, I want to thank Matt and Jennifer for assisting uh, in this no override budget scenario. Tonight, I will present my recommended no override budget, which the board will be discussing at their January 8th meeting. I wanted to say that these recommendations come from my six years of having worked with and understanding the core functions of the town department. Also, in my 10 plus years as a town administrator, understanding what can happen when cuts are made too broadly. What you'll see tonight are reductions that are deliberate and with great thought as to what the impact would be from an operational perspective. And then from the town's, um, the town's point of view, creating a no override budget is difficult. Creating a no override budget now with an already low level service budget means we are cutting into the room of town services. With that, I will share. So we're gonna start with uh, free cash. As you know, free cash is certified every year. The chart on the screen shows the free cash amounts that have been certified since 2022, the use of that free cash within the fiscal year, and then the carry forward year over year. In FY25, you will see that the starting point is $11.8 million. And the 2.4 million and the 552,000 for OPED and operating budget, that's reflected of a $3 million total of free cash that we're using um, in the operating budget. We have no transfers for general stabilization, but we do have 107,000 this year of free cash that is dedicated to the opioid settlements. That will be, has to be transferred to the opioid fund. We can only use that for opioid uh, funded programs. We also have 1.5 million as a set aside for capital. Uh, we're looking at uh, the chenery, the roof and the boilers need to be replaced. And then the $3.1 million you see here is the override offset, which we are proposing to use um, in the event of an override to offset the override over the next three years. And in the no override scenario, um, what we'll be using as well. And then that also has a carry forward of $4.1 million which is per our fiscal policy to set aside three to five percent of free cash um, aside. Looking at a no override option, the funding available for a no override budget, we will be using uh, the base tax revenue adjusted for Prop two and a half, along with the estimated receipts and local aid that we are estimating. We have dedicated remaining free cash uh, for FY25 at $3.1 million, the number I referenced before. And in FY26, we are putting aside $1.5 million into that no, over, no override budget scenario. Then we fund the shared service items. This is, as you know, debt service, pension, benefits, insurance, facilities, and the utilities in the town. We have removed our proposed investments in the override. That's the additional capital funding that I've recommended for sidewalks and also the project manager in the facilities department. So once we do all that, we have remaining funds available for the municipal and school services. So looking at the FY25 <coughs> no override, the town and the schools have budgeted to that number in the second column. The town is budgeting to $32.5 million and the schools are budgeting 63.5 million. Our budgets tonight will reflect those numbers. And from the 1130 summit, which was the um, override summit, override <coughs> budget summit, 800,000 that the town would have to reduce from that number and the schools, the 2.2 million. And then we did a similar exercise for FY26. So for FY26, we would have to budget to those numbers that are reflected in that chart. So the town has done a considerable amount since the last override in FY21 and uh, April of 2021. But after the failed override in April, the town had reduced the side by five FTE. I've said this often in the past. Uh, we have we had eliminated two DPW laborers, police officer, a firefighter, and a resident engineer. We are keeping the resident engineer in the no override. Um, scenario budget, but we had eliminated positions um, in other departments. 
Other efficiencies that we've made, we've looked at replacing the street lights with LED lights that has given us a considerable amount of savings over the years. We've looked at revenue enhancements over the years. We have looked to change the way we bill for ambulances. And we have looked at uh, local receipts, such as investment income and how we estimate those local receipts. So that has generated some additional revenue in town. Uh, we have right-sized benefits. When Jennifer came on uh, over a year ago, one of the things she did is really dig down into how we were spending uh, for the benefit side, and we were able to see savings in that in those lines. And finally, we've done a lot of combining of positions. Um, in the Human Resources Office, in my office, and assessors, we've taken jobs through whether or not it was attrition or retirement, um, and we merged those positions with other positions in those offices. We created efficiencies, and that resulted in savings. In FY24 to 25, we've done a lot of restructuring, capitalizing on staff transitions and retirements. One of the things that I have done over the years, whenever there is a vacancy in any department, we look at ways that we can either restructure, combine, just to make efficiencies within the, that department. In community development, you know we've changed that to planning and building, and we've moved engineering department under DPW. In recreation, we are moving programming and we're also moving a part-time position into the revolving fund, no longer funded by the operating budget. We're planning and preparing for the rink and the library that will be opening in 2025. And also with the change in the administration and the treasurer's office, we are realigning staff, aligning <coughs> some of those functions. So we've done a lot over the last few years. So when you're looking to reduce even further, there's only a few places you can and I figured I needed to set that up for you as we walk into where, where we look to and where I'm recommending that we. <clears throat> so on the municipal side for a new override, I want to preface this by saying there's a lot more work that we need to do for FY26. We're drilling down from FY25 to numbers and you'll see numbers reflected there. And the board, as I stated, will be going over that in more detail on January 8th. But, but for FY26, there's some studies and some other things we really need to consider because those are going to be the, really the impact to not only um, services, but life-saving services. So for trash, we are proposing in FY25 to charge residents for fees for bulky item pickup along with mattress recycling. We are proposing in FY25 to reduce yard waste pickups. Currently, there are 23 annual pickups for yard waste we are proposing to drop that down to 16. Now, given that that number is going to drop, then we have to figure out operationally when those are gonna be. That's gonna be a considerable impact to the residents. In FY26, we're looking to further reduce that service. Consider a pay as you throw program. And this is going to take a lot of work and research to look into how we would go about doing this. But we feel there's a savings on this um, pay as you throw. For police and fire, in FY25, we are going to freeze any vacancies on the fire in the fire department and we're reducing the staff in the, in the fire we've identified by 2.5 FTEs. In the police department, we're scaling back the purchasing of equipment replacement. And the other thing we're doing with the police department is I'm eliminating the animal control officer in the health department. That is going to be absorbed by the police department. I've asked the police chief to come up with a plan and exactly how, re, how we're going to be doing that. That is something, another position that we're losing and being absorbed within the police department. We're also reducing BEMA funding. BEMA is the emergency management agency that the town has. Uh, we'll be reducing funding on that side as well. And in FY26, we want to further reduce staff in the fire department by, F, by EFTE. This is something that, again, we need to research and study. Um, the fire chief, I've asked the fire chief to start uh, conducting a response time study um, starting January 1st. We really understand any change in the service of the fire department. What would the impact be on response time within the community? General government, FY25, we are planning to consolidate polling locations. Currently, there are seven locations town, we will be working with the town clerk that maybe by half. That obviously is going to put um, some inconvenience um, in the residents who vote. 
We plan to fund early voting costs from anticipated state grants. So we're taking that funding out as anticipating state, state funding for those programs. In my line, I have a diversity, equity, and inclusion funding of about $24,000. Um, that goes to events throughout the community in the year, goes to some training that we have within the staff. I'm going to be eliminating that as well. And then we're also reducing staff by one FTE under general government. This will be in the treasurer's office. In FY26, we will continue to review opportunities for further efficiencies under general government. Finally, under human services, in FY25, we are going to, we are proposing to reduce the staff at the Council on Aging and the Health Department by 3.1 FTEs. I'm also recommending that we don't fill the senior center director uh, until we have an answer to the override. We plan to reduce expenses to reflect recent spending levels and updated projections. This is the library. The library um, we are reducing to MAR. That is the minimum amount that the state allows us to go to to remain in the Minuteman uh, library system. <clears throat> and then for FY26, we plan to further look at the reduction of hours open at the library, which plans to open in the fall of 2025. Again, this is something that needs to be discussed and uh, further reviewed. So to sum up, on the municipal side, the overall staff reduction, FY25, we are proposing 6 FTEs, along with expenses that's in human services, public safety, and general government, and in FY26, eight FTEs in public safety. There's also a corresponding savings and benefits, which we've also captured. That is the town side. Teresa, I guess I have a couple of comments right away, but I'll wait for everybody. Um, okay, uh, that's the town side. We turn to the school side, and uh, actually, I'd like to recognize Meg Moriarty for, for a couple of remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Roy. Um, and thank you, Patrice, for that presentation and for your um, introduction remarks. Um, so I just wanted to say a few things. The school committee did preview these budgets um, last night and the budget scenarios that you will see tonight. Um, they show really deep cuts to our school system that are quite unsettling. So I wanna be really clear that the school committee and the school department are, are not recommending any of these budget scenarios. Um, in fact, I don't think the select board or anybody um, on any committee in town would actually vote in favor of these cuts. But the reality is that this spring, without an override, these scenarios will have to be implemented. Um, Roy has stated many times that without an override, Belmont won't be the same. Um, as Patrice was saying in her intro, there have been cuts to the town side. Well, over the years, the schools have made many reductions to programming and to staffing. We've uh, cut librarians, community service coordinators, strings, languages, Metco aides, just to name a few. Um, and so I argue that Belmont will have a really hard time saying that it has an excellent school system anymore if we're actually forced to implement these non-override budget scenarios. Um, you'll see tonight that they're going to impact all families. They'll impact athletes, musicians, performers. Uh, we will not be able to improve our special education programming, investments that we need to benefit all students, uh, like what we showed the last time with our math and our liter literacy curriculum will be impossible. Um, and we will not have the ability to implement any of the advanced coursework for those who are asking for it. But I will say, just speaking for myself, that I'm really hopeful that we will not have to implement any of these cuts that you see tonight. Um, I've always been thankful for the support of the Belmont community for our schools and how they value education and, and our young people. Just a few months ago, we celebrated the opening of the middle high school that was built thanks to the overwhelming support of our community. Tomorrow morning, I'm gonna go over to the queue and I think it's an important reminder that the school district is still reconfiguring, which was part of the vision. We've heard it from former school committee members. It was part of the vision that the voter was promised when they voted for that new school. And as current leaders, I believe that we must do what we can to continue to work towards this vision. It was part of the expectation. Um, I'm thankful for the leadership of our select board who have unanimously and publicly stated their support for an override this spring. And I believe the community can pass a successful override so that the budget scenarios that Jill's about to show you will never become a reality. Um, the school committee is committed to providing the select board with an override and a non-override budget on the 25th, so that together we can socialize them to the community, 
and inform the community well in advance um, of when they have to go to vote in April. With that, I will turn it over to Jill to present the budget scenarios. Great, thank you. Um, just to give some uh, words of introduction first, thank you all for um, just this process, bringing everybody together to talk through these very challenging conversations. Um, every time I enter into this non-override conversation, I feel it in, I feel it a lot, right? And it's sort of like, it's almost like you don't wanna say the words, right? What, what we would need to do if the override doesn't pass. I will also say, listening, also looking at Patrice, I turned to Lucia and Patrice was talking about the reduction. So I'm like, as a resident, I feel it even more. So I'm sort of wearing two hats right now and it's very, um, it's, it's hard, it's really difficult. Um, the one part that I, I echo uh, Meg's words about hope and part of the hope comes from this process and the collaboration that exists in this room um, among all of us. And, and I, um, I lean on that a lot in terms of getting through, through the, this process. Um, so again, echoing Patrice's comments about it cutting into the bones. Yes, same thing with schools. Um, this will in the end impact our students and families. In the override budget, what I was adding was to um, move us past some of the reductions that had happened in the past, right? So there in that override budget, I talked about outdated curriculum, the staffing needs to support students in the areas of intervention and special education, the needed positions to provide systemic support to educators working with students in classrooms. Um, and so this doesn't even begin to account for that. So we're not, we're starting at not even being able to fill the gaps that we are seeing. Um, in mind that these reductions that we see, we see the dollar signs that go with the labels of the reductions. We have to remember that it's not just about re the, it decreasing the dollar amount. We are removing resources from classrooms and schools, and that will bring a, bring a decline, a decline of students' learning experiences. And we have to do that when we have these conversations. That said, um, I'm just going to roll through the first few slides, which you've seen before. The intro, the timeline, which um, you can keep clicking through because it's it in. Um, which we know it's running through since August we started the process and now um, landing in December. The objectives we've seen before, as well as the assumptions on the next slide, um, and those have guided us through the process. So uh, what we're gonna show tonight is we're gonna start with the um, level service that Tony will take us through. Uh, you will see some change in our rollover in level service. And then from there, I'll talk about the reductions um, from our level service. Thank you, Dr. Geiser. So Dr. Geiser indicated uh, there's some changes here. Uh, we presented the rollover budget at the budget summit two at the last meeting. Uh, two lines that have changed here. I'll start first with a line that hasn't changed uh, like the other one's attention to the third line down, uh, labeled as uh, COLA steps to be uh, increases. There's a change uh, from 24 to 25, an actual decrease of 9,000. We received some questions about that. I want to make clear that reduction uh, represents the fact that we have uh, eliminated the one time expense in FY24, some administrative transitions and uh, some expenses related to the reconfiguration of uh, grade, uh, grade seven and eight moving up uh, to the middle school from Chenner. So that those that uh, that cost is captured there. The, the two lines on the sheet that, are, that have changed since the last budget summit are the special ed tuition and transportation lines. Uh, and we'll, we'll go into that detail uh, in a moment. Uh, before we go, I'll just mark the fact uh, that our roll forward budget, uh, this we're calling this draft two, 66.2 million, almost 66.3 million. That's an increase of 3,376,000 over uh, the FY24 budget, which is a 5.37% increase. And if we can go to the uh, next slide, uh, th this is the detail of what the changes are in the tuition and uh, spread transportation lines. Uh, one in the middle of the page there, that bolded line, $202,509. That represents the net change for FY25 for special education out of district tuitions. That number is the increase from the draft one budget that was included in the budget summit to the last meeting. 
to now uh, tonight's meeting, which is in our uh, school draft two FY25 budget. Uh, to, at a summary level, the way that we're calculating uh, the out of district tuition expenses for next year, we're, we're starting with this year's cohort with the literal uh, POs, purchase orders that we have on the books uh, for those representing those uh, students who are in our district placements. We done a monthly snapshot of that and we compare uh, the recent monthly snapshot, the snapshot we had taken in November, we're actually uh, represents a decrease in expected uh, expenses for this year. That's what that negative $260,000 number is. Uh, and uh, Dr. Geiser and I met with our uh, special education leadership in the district, and we have identified uh, approximately <clears throat> six students who may have developing needs that at some point during this year uh, could result in some additional placements. We've identified placeholder uh, tuitions for FY24 of approximately $75,000 per student. Uh, so a lot of variables. Uh, and that's results in an estimated cost for expenses uh, potentially to be incurred this year of another 450,000. Those two numbers net together for a net change of about $189,000 uh, for this year that we would uh, otherwise expect uh, to spend. And when we take that number to increase our base for next year, we would also index that $189,000 projected delta by the index factor we've been using for special education tuitions, which is 7% currently. And that would uh, $13,000. Some of those $202,000 that uh, we're uh, including as an increase from draft one to draft two for special education on district tuitions for next year. Uh, below the line, that section is our special ed transportation based on, again, the current POs that we have in place now. Uh, we're projecting uh, approximately $100,000 deficit in uh, transportation, but transportation expenses for FY24, including a, a quarterly update last night at the school committee. And that's an FY24 projected cost. And we're indexing that cost by 7% again for next year, that'd be 107,000. So the 202 and the 107 gets us the uh, increased amount of about uh, 309,000 for next year. Uh, and that, that results in uh, increase uh, from draft one to draft two, the 309,000 to give us the uh, Just to, to finish off uh, the current piece, if we can go to the next slide, we'll actually pass by the reallocation. There's been no change since the previous budget summit. No change in the uh, uh, needed increases since the last summit. But to summarize what we've been talking about, uh, using that roll of a number that we just discussed and uh, the other uh, elements that we, uh, no changes from the last uh, summit. Our level of service budget is 66,781,000 plus. That is a, an increase over the FY24 budget of 3,894,000 plus, which is a 6.9% increase at Y24. That, I'll turn it back to you, Superintendent Geyser, to uh, discuss the non override budget scenarios. Um, so when we are looking at our non override budget scenarios, um, we are uh, starting with the level service, and um, I'll explain a little bit how we're adjusting that in these scenarios. Uh, what you're gonna see tonight are two scenarios which I presented to the school committee last night. We are working off of these two scenarios at the moment. On January 9th, I'm gonna to bring to the school, uh, school committee one scenario that will um, likely be some kind of hybrid between those two scenarios. And I will note what the differences are with them. And the reason is because it's taken us some time to work through the different elements on the, the reductions that we identified back in November. So it's just taking us some, uh, some time to get through that. Um, so. I'll start with the first overview. Um, so we have the 63.7 uh, rev available revenue that we have to stay within um, our level services, 6.7. Here's where we're adjusting that level service. We are um, part of those needing increases were for additional buses to the amount of $304,000 for uh, the, that will be involved with the transition process of the fourth grade going up to the queue. Um, because our transportation is one of our reductions, we are dropping the level service by that amount for a starting point. 
simply because if we we would add and then decrease anyway, so we're just um, landing with the starting point with that taken out. Um, so that brings us to a $2.7 million reduction for FY25. So the two scenarios um, that I'm going to present are, will involve these tiers of reductions, which is what I used back in November when I initially presented the non-override at that school committee meeting and a public forum. Uh, what these will say is these are the places that we would look for a second, third, and so forth. So the first place in this particular scenario one, uh, the first place we look is professional development and transportation. And then we look to extracurriculars and then um, to programs and resources and then staffing. I'll get us to the summer slide more in depth between them. And then scenario two is um, various, the same tiers minus the extracurriculars. So that's gonna be one key difference between the first and the second scenario, which you'll see on the next slide. Um, I won't write, okay. Um, so what you see here is hard to read. Um, just to talk through, just to talk through what these um, particular reductions are. So in the first tier, you're looking at professional development, transportation, both of which uh, would be reduced in either scenario. Um, professional development is simply draw, taking out what we have currently in there minus any contractual obligations for programs like mentoring. So in the contract, we have to provide mentoring for teachers. We have to make sure we have the budget for that. And this reduces um, the other item, the other, um, the remaining general fund in that particular line item. As you can imagine, once you start chipping away at the professional development, that um, undermines our ability to provide those professional learning opportunities for our staff, which is very critical to um, developing the teaching and learning for students in our schools. The transportation, and this is what I was referring before to the $304,000, um, we would be reducing that to the legal minimum requirement, which is essentially students up through sixth grade who live beyond two miles from the school and no obligation for grade seven on up. So that would be reducing that amount from the general fund in, under transportation. The most probably most significant issue with that is um, students who rely heavily on transportation to get to school would not have that available to them from the school department. Um, and then a, another, a, several other issues that would arise like more traffic and things like that would certainly be um, some potential fallout from that as well. Extracurriculars, so this is why they differ between the two scenarios. This is one of the pieces of feedback that we got after we initially presented um, these different tiers of reductions, just around what exactly that does that look like with programming. One complicated factor with extracurriculars is that we do have um, a lot of the programs that depend on fees and then a chunk of the programming that depend on the general fund. What you see here is just general fund dollars. Generally speaking, um, those dollars tend to fund more on the athletic side. Half of our athletics program is funded by the general fund, as well as others, um, clubs and after school activities, um, mostly in the middle and the high school. So that is largely what those funds are. It does a little bit in the music side around travel, um, I think some other like programming pieces, but most of the art staff are supported by fees as it stands right now. Um, so those are the two, uh, the first tier and the second tier are the ones that um, are just sort of listed right here. And I'm gonna ask you to go to the third slide. So here's where I provide a little more detail around these particular elements that we'd be reducing. In both scenarios one and two, we would be looking at curriculum purchases. Um, and again, this and keeping in mind that we would, this is not just reducing curriculum purchases. This is also saying we can't invest in the curriculum that I was asking for in the override scenario. So this is not only not investing, but it's actually taking away even more capacity around having high quality curriculum in the classroom. Instructional materials and supplies. This one is um, really important to, to think about because we are essentially reducing the items and supplies and materials that teachers use to deliver instruction in the classroom. And so that, that will 
really kind of impede their ability to do that at a high level. The other piece with this is our PTOs, PTAs, and FBE currently provide quite a bit of funding for classroom materials. So this would um, probably put more of a weight on them to do that. And the one biggest issue with that is that doesn't necessarily guarantee that we get the supplies through those funding sources. It would be helpful, but um, having it in our general fund just means that it's going to be there um, definitely. Technology in the very same way as the um, materials and supplies. Uh, again, we, are, we would be limiting access to, for teachers to instructional technology to help with um, teaching and learning. The other piece with this is also um, reducing the district's ability to, for maintaining and replacing hardware um, in the tech, tech. So we are now starting to talk about staffing. Um, we grouped these in, um, you'll see these as staffing groups. And uh, this one has staffing under both scenarios. Again, um, it would be the same production that we are looking at. Uh, the first one is we labeled as seasonal staff and essentially this would be, um, we would be reducing the home tutoring budget. And th the reason why we are looking at that as a reduction is that's based on past spending patterns. Um, and the only caveat with that is that if we happen to get um, a more need for home tutoring beyond the budget, then we would be in a challenging position in providing that need. Um, the curriculum work, this is what teachers do in the summer. As you can see, it's a very low amount anyway. We would reduce that. Um, then we are looking at leadership and administration. We would be reducing our curriculum directors um, as well as admin staff from those departments of finance, technology, and HR. With the curriculum directors, this means that teachers have less support on the curriculum side. Um, these directors work with teachers around curriculum implementation, pedagogy, um, meeting the needs of students. So this um, limits their time that they can give teachers around those with that support. And then in the, the those various departments that you're just looking at reducing the, again, weakening the system that supports teachers to do the work in their classrooms. So um, that's just something to remember when we look at those types of reductions. Also, now we're in a staffing group B, which is clerical <laughs> staff. Uh, again, same across both scenarios. The clerical staff with this reduction, this also contributes to the weakening of the system that supports students and staff. The other thing piece with this particular reduction as well as other reductions this kicks into is that you might reduce the staff, but the workload doesn't reduce. So that workload has to be absorbed by other people. Um, which we, we have a lot of workload as is, so that would only increase what people already have on their plates. Um, and then under support staff, we are looking at um, reducing kindergarten aids um, from five days to four, campus monitor position and library aids, and this would reduce support for students, um, campus monitors who um, provide supervision for student safety, and then uh, reduce the access to libraries. Here's where the two scenarios diverge. Um, in the first scenario, you will see fewer teachers reduced. That is the scenario where extracurriculars are reduced. And in scenario two, you have more teachers reduced. Um, in that scenario, we are keeping extracurricular funding in place. Um, the, big, the biggest piece about reducing the teachers, as soon as you start reducing teachers, you're looking at larger class sizes, um, limited electives at the secondary level. And then for elementary students, um, if we, there's a potential to increase the number of students that need to transfer to other schools in order to balance out classes or um, there's more room in one school versus the other, that kind of thing. Uh, the one piece, so this is where the two scenarios as I said, they diverge here relative to the extracurricular. In the beginning, I said I would be pulling together one scenario. I'm looking between these two scenarios and we'll tease out information on extracurriculars to pull together one scenario for the school committee on the ninth. But this, this is essentially what we're working with at this point. 
So one of the things I just want to point out, and um, this is kind of a visual I provided to give a picture of when we are talking about these reductions, again, this is not just about like lowering, reducing or decreasing the budget amount, but this is what we're looking at at impact. Um, it's, pulling, it's pulling away from the um, supports for students, the core academics, it's pulling away at the systems of operations and safety, and it's limiting access to programs. So that's when I talked about the transportation is an access question. The extracurriculars is an access question. And same thing with the libraries when you're reducing the amount of time that the libraries are open. So this is just something to kind of make sure we, we understand like what that what these reductions, um, how that impacts. And on the next one, same idea, but you're just sort of seeing how um, each one is sort of plugged in in one of these categories. There is overlap between them. So, you know, these they can impact multiple categories, but this is um, mostly where they would fall. So for FY26, we have, um, I'm going to be expressing an approach of how we would be looking at this. Um, once we have identified our FY21 reductions, we'll more be able to more clearly know what, would, what it might look like in 26. So the way we would be thinking about it though, is um, the tiers of reductions uh, covered up through five tiers. And with those reductions, we uh, got up to about 4.5 million. What we would do is go back to those tiers and see what was not reduced and possibly include that in FY26. And then if we still need to reduce more beyond that, which I suspect we would, we would have more categories, more administrative, more administration or leadership staffing, more support and instructional staff. Um, possibly in more in the instructional materials, it depends on how much we can chip away at that as well. One note is in the original tiers, we had a school closure at the last tier, as like the, the last step. I, I've taken it off the table for FY25. I don't know if we will, if it would be on the table for FY26. That's still, that's a lingering question. And these are just overall levels of impact. Again, you're looking at a systemic impact education. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, thank you um, for that presentation. I'd like to open it up now. I have two more slides. Oh, two more slides. Excuse me, Sorry. Patrice has more. So. Sorry, it's just to close out the presentation. <laughs> Briefly, this is just history of the, the uh, past and field overrides of uh, the past 30 years. Um, oh, so uh, prop yeah, two and a half. Yeah. Prop two and a half, thank you. Um, what's interesting to note is um, based on the conversations with the board, this will be the highest uh, override the town has requested uh, since. I fails four of four yeses. Um, and then next steps. So on January 8th, um, I think I mentioned in my remarks, the board has a meeting. We'll be discussing the override and the no override planning at that meeting. January 18th is a public forum on transitioning the assessors from elected to appointed. On January 19th, a budget, which is the recommended budget by my uh, town administrator and superintendent, that will be printed and sent out. Uh, January 22nd, we have a special town meeting um, for the transition transition of assessors um, at the for the annual election. 24th, the governor's budget is released. January 25th will be budget summit number four. That'll be the traditionally what is the annual budget presentation for the no override and the override budget by myself and superintendent. And then finally, finally January 30th, uh, the board will be meeting to hopefully make a final determination of the override amount for the April 2nd election. So that's where we are looking at the new year. Right. Uh, so this was, um, um, as Meg indicated, nobody is happy about this, but this is necessary planning because there is no assurance that an override will be successful, but this clearly presents a very uh, dark picture for town services, town and school services across the board. Uh, but just to make sure we understand where this is all coming from because there was a lot of information presented. Patrice, I wondered if you could go back 
Uh, I think it's just slide two or three. Uh, uh, <coughs> no, go, go up, back up. Thank you. <clears throat> go up one more. Well, maybe I'll split my comments across across both slides. So, at a high up level, I think people just uh, should remember where this is all coming from. Uh, the we have clearly a fiscal twenty four budget, uh, but a lot of that fiscal twenty four budget was made possible by use of free cash and ARPA money. That's not going to be available in fiscal 25. So if you take the, um, the recurring revenue, which is you know, property tax, and then the other categories of recurring revenue. Uh, so the property tax grows at two and a half percent and there's new growth and there's local receipts and all of that. When you roll that forward to fiscal 25, uh, you don't even get to current spending levels. You're, you're, be, you're in fiscal 25, if you roll forward your recurring revenue, you're actually in fiscal 25, you will be below fiscal 24 because those one-time monies from fiscal 24 disappear. So to try to mitigate that, we all recognize that we have what we've been calling excess free cash and we're going to utilize that. So as this slide shows, uh, the starting point for fiscal 25 is 11.8 million in certified free cash. That's the number we got a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the number in the bottom row, which is roughly 4 million or a little over 4 million, is the amount that we are committed by our uh, financial policies to keep really as in, as in the bank. We don't, we're not going to go into that. That means then between the, the 4 million and the 11 million is roughly $6 million. Uh, that is going to be utilized over a two year horizon uh, in this no override scenario. We have a different proposal for the override that I'm not going to repeat because it'll just confuse everybody. But since we're now talking about a no override scenario, the excess free cash of roughly, what's the number? It's roughly seven million, is actually going to be drawn down in a planned way for fiscal twenty five and fiscal twenty six, and it's going to be uh, distributed so that some of it goes into the general fund, where it gets allocated between town side functions and school side functions, and some of it's going to be earmarked capital spend. But the key point is that uh, under this, as it's been laid out here, uh, and the implications that are uh, made more specific in the next slide, by the end of fiscal 26, the excess free cash is expected to be gone, will be down to the reserve level, which means that uh, we're going to have another dire situation in fiscal 27. But I, I, what I wanna make clear is that we are drawing upon reserves to mitigate the effects of a failed override, but that mitigation is going to be relatively modest. And that strategy will be fully played out by fiscal 26. There, there won't be any excess free cash to um, now, barring some miracle, but you can't count on a miracle, uh, there, there won't be any more excess free cash to draw upon. And you know, the print's a little small, but this slide, uh, just to repeat, even though uh, Prop 2.5 revenues go up by 2.5%, and there are other categories of um, revenue growth, such that the recurring revenue growth is more like three or three and a half percent. 
the role of the one-time monies in fiscal 24 is so large that when you take that away, uh, which kind of deflates everything, in fiscal 25, you're only looking at a 1.4% a increase in your spending when we know that the expenses of uh, maintaining the services that we're currently providing are growing much more than 1.4%. So that, that is what is the, the, the box that we're in that's leading to the reductions that were outlined for both the towns, town budgets and school budgets. Uh, so just maybe everybody was following all of that uh, during the presentations, but just for the, everybody's benefit, including those who are attending remotely from the public, I just wanted to recap how we got to where we are today. Roy, can I ask a question about that slide too, just to make sure I understand? Is the 3,129 in the override offset, is that the reserve that will be carried forward into cover fiscal year 26? Should there be no override? It will load a free, will be part of our free cash certification for 26. Well, whatever. So we're calling it total uses of 7 7, but we're really the total uses in the fiscal year 25 budget is the 7 7 minus the 3 129. Can't follow. We need to roll up the <laughs> roll up the slide, please, because now, well, now we're one, confused. Jack, one, one thing that was not mentioned here is that this budget is predicated on a recurring use of three million of free cash. Understood. Um, and I, I, so I that revenue will be in fiscal year twenty five revenue, and and that's the operating budget OPEB number, right? The five fifty two. The three million is the combination of the operating budget and OPEP. Plus the, the 500, so that's what gets the three million recurring. Yep. Right. And then there's an additional 3.1 million that is recommended to be used in N25. In 20. Read the, read the notes there. Proposal to set aside portion of current free cash to offset requested override. And then one five goes into the capital stabilization fund. So you're you're using seven point seven, Jack, and you're rolling over. If you go up just a hair. So that seven seven is in the budget. Yeah. I, so where is the discipline about saving some of the eleven? The rolling for next year, Jack. If you follow, there's four point one three eight zero seven eight that rolls over into twenty six. That's the remaining amount. Is right. Because you'll you'll decimate the the reserve number. Violate the policy. No, no. This with, with this additional. Could I, additional so could I could I just clarify? So I think it's not that confusing. This chart is being used for the override budget and the no override budget. The the three point one two nine is would be put into this in the event that the override passes. We put it into an override mitigation fund. Right. That would be available to use in FY twenty six and FY twenty seven. So would the 1.5 would conceivably be put into a capital stabilization fund to then be available to for a future capital need. But in the event that the override does not pass, those though both of those funding streams would be repurposed to help offset any adjustments to the override to the to the cuts to the expenses in this year 25. It'll be spent instantaneously. They would be added to the FY25 budget. The three million would be added to the FY25 budget and conceivably the 1.5 million, instead of being put into a capital stabilization fund, would be put into another fund that would be reserved for use for the FY26 budget. So, so then I'm just thinking that's, that's a key distinction. If I could, this is, uh, could I echo that? This is, we don't confuse everybody. We, we have, looks like we confuse everybody. We confuse everybody. Uh, yes. Chris. <laughs> it might be handy to have this chart have an additional column that had FY26. Yeah. That would be a handy addition to this chart. I would submit it actually is a little bit confusing at the risk of being contradictory. So uh, a column that had FY26 would be handy because I actually was not assuming that the 1.5 disappeared from capital stabilization. I was assuming it came from the balance at the bottom. So um, maybe in the next version, we add FY26. Can I ask you? Sure. Jennifer, the two, four, four, seven, two on lines two and three, that's going to get spent 
The intent is for that to be spent in 25, regardless of an override. Absolutely. Yes. If there's an override that passes, the 3129 and the 1.5 will be set aside for future purposes for future years to be determined at that time how they're used. Mm -hmm. If the, And I believe what you're saying is if the override fails, the 1.5 and the 3129 will fall into the 25 will be available for 25 expenditures. Is that right? And then the 4138 will be carried over as our base number for uh, free cash, sort of the, the, the floor on free cash. Everything you said is correct, except that instead of the 1.5 being spent immediately, the intent is for the 1.5 to be held for reserve for FY26. Okay. So if the override does not pass, we're going to, we're going to spend three, 6.129 in 25, mm -hmm. right? The 3 million up top plus the 3129. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if the override passes, we spend 3 million in, in free cash. If the override fails, we spend 6 million in free cash. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Yes. And we don't repair the Chenery board. Right. <laughs> But that's still, I, I'm puzzled by Roy's comment earlier then that in it, we're doing this in a disciplined way to also save free cash for fiscal year 26, because it doesn't seem like, it seems like we're exhausting it down to the minimum threshold of what our reserve policy is. Well, it's the choice not to use the 1.5 for capital in FY25. The 1.5 that's earmarked here in FY25 for the capital stabilization in the event of a failed override would no longer be earmarked for capital. It would be earmarked for FY26 uh, mitigation, free cash to mitigate the impact. That's, or at least that's what you've laid out here, right, Jennifer? Yeah. Can I, 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 I ask able, sorry, sorry, go ahead. It's a clarifying question then. Oh, the math went away, darn it. Um, so of the two pink columns, would it make sense if you were to redo this chart? Okay, so if the override fails, 3.129439 gets spent in FY25, and the 1.5 is reserved to offset in FY26, correct? So if you look at the next slide, what that indicates is what funding sources are available in the no override budget that we're putting together. Okay. Right. We're budgeting to, for the no override in 2025, 32.59 million. That includes $3 million of recurring free cash and $3.1 million of the remaining free cash. Right. Can you go back to the other one, though? Because just to Jack's point, what I was going to say was I think in theory, then, the remaining balance of free cash would, in theory, in the failed override, have that 1.5 in it, would it not? No, because the absolute, what we should be doing is actually setting it aside as so town. Keeping it out of the free cash. Not part. want it to roll forward and okay. inflate the number of the override. Right. Of okay. The cash so for I do think an FY26 column would make this. Yeah. I think should... realistically, this chart was meant to, to reflect something entirely different. That's right. So I think what we should do is completely start over and, and have a. Can you... <laughs> I wasn't Next saying year. that, but sorry. You know. I think what's important here is to un, un, here to clarify the question. No, one more. Go go to the okay. going the other way for it down. Further down, please. In yellow there. Right here, where you say fiscal 25, no override, 32 million point five nine available for municipal. This is after this, you know, the um for sort of expenses are, are funded, mm -hmm. right? This That's is right. 32 million for municipal. And which is 1.37% increase, $44,000, whatever, whatever that is. And, um, or is that 440,000? What is that number? 0. 0.44, 440. That's and then for a school, 63.75, which is what Dr. Geiser just went through in terms of her reductions, for 860,000 increase, so 1.37%. The two together is 2.7, um, whatever it is, 2.7% increase for those two amounts, if you have to combine the two. Okay. Do those amounts, the 32 and the 63, include not only the 3 million, but also the 3.1 million? Yes. That's, okay. what that's, the, that's what I thought. Yeah. So there isn't one 3 million 129 that rolls over to 25. It's used in a no override scenario. Right. right. That's right. Understood. That's a good 25. Perfect on question, yeah. which, which then suggests that the only thing that's available in a no override scenario is the the amount that we have committed under our free 
free cash guidelines, if you will, and the 1.5 in capital staff, and also there's amounts in, in general staff. So you'd have to transfer the 1.5 from the capitalization stabilization fund into the operating budget, which would well, it's a consideration, Jack. Town meeting, I assume. You know, it, you, it's not yet allocated. It's not yet allocated. It's not yet allocated. It's not yet. It's not yet been appropriated. Intended. To do low free cash, earmarked to potentially do that. In the event of a failed override, that would not happen. It would instead go to another yeah, right. That's that's the right. Gotcha. For FY20. And that gets to Jennifer's. This uh, chart wasn't intended to reflect. <laughs> right. Let, let me just re try to repeat uh, what I hope is a simple point without getting uh, immersed in the details of these tables. We, we, we have a known amount of excess free cash today. And the intent of the no override budget is to exhaust the is to exhaust the excess free cash that's by the right. end of fiscal 26. That's right. And exactly how that's done is getting lost in the weeds here. But the, there will not be any more. The, the, the plan here is to not have any more excess free cash in two years. This is, this is us deploying the airbags. Can I, can I ask a question? 12, almost 12 million. And we deploy the first airbag of 3.1 and the next airbag is 1.5 million and then we're done. Yes, you're exactly right, Matt. Uh, Jamal? Um, just gonna switch the conversation for a second around the fiscal year 26. So um, what is, given that, given that we have a number on these slides for what we expect the schools and town to be, what the revenue is available for the school and town for fiscal year 26, what is the actual deficit that we anticipate in fiscal year 26, assuming a one and a half million reuse from the capital to plug that gap? What is, what is, what is that? Is that 3 million, 4 million, 1 million? I don't understand the question. I don't either. In fiscal year 26, there's a deficit, going to be a deficit, right? Mm -hmm. Right. What's the deficit relative to the amount that will be, how much are we going to need to cut from the school and the town is the question. It kind of depends, depends on the starting uh, starting point, right. okay. and and also as as Dr. Geyser noted, you know it's it, any adjustments that we make in FY twenty five make an adjustment for the for where we need to to make further adjustments for FY twenty six. So it's a it's a moving target a little bit. So Tom, what is what is the what does your, the model say? I'll, I'll echo actually Jennifer's point. It's really about what you use as your FY25 baseline to determine what your 26 number is to compute that deficit. Right. So if we took the existing FY25 projections that we had previously and we rolled them forward with historical growth rates, that's a $9 million deficit. But that wouldn't be what we would be working with. We would be working with a lower deficit because you'd be growing off of a lower FY25 base. And I can compute that. I can't compute it on the fly. I'm happy to do it though. So just to clarify, you would take the proposed FTE cuts, proposed service cuts, and plug those in and make a new FY25 base and then project out 26 to 7, et cetera. Right. I mean, you could pick whatever growth numbers you wanted, but you could use just sure. the historical growth we've used, we've used previously, see where you end up, and then you can look at what your deficit is. You need, you need to put these scenarios into the model. Yeah. To, to, uh, I, on the table on page three. You'll be careful to keep that away. The microphone. Oh. 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 <laughs> I did the thing I didn't want to do. I made it happen. I'm sorry. <laughs> I almost made it better, and then I made that it one's worse. on the ground too, in front. Of Get that on camera. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can we just so the the table on page three, the sixty three point seven five. Oh, excuse me. Uh, they're not added. Fine. 3259 and the 6375 for municipal and schools. That ties to the table on page two. The dollar amounts actually go up slightly and they'd go up by a million five more than what's shown on a million uh, on this table as we talked about. So in dollars, the dollars go up. The problem is that the expense growth rate is faster than that, so there is a shortfall. It, it, it's, it's not a 
reduction in revenue. It's just a, a, an increase in revenue uh, at 0.8% that is well shy of what our expense growth rate is. You'd have to find that difference in the budget. So yes. That's what we presented this evening. Okay, so just maybe try to state this one more time or a different way. Um, the, the proposed budgets with the various cuts that have been discussed lead to 32.59 municipal and fiscal 25 and 63.75 on the school side. Uh, so if we then move on to fiscal 26, where this, let's start with the municipal side as shown as 32.86, which is a, a microscopic increase. It's from 32.59 to 32.86. What, what is the assumption that limits the expenditure to such a tiny increase? It's just. Sorry, we're gonna pull up the no override um, allocation, budget allocation that we presented to the board and the. Well, I think Roy, there's, there's two things that you actually already mentioned, which is we've been bolstering our numbers with expenditures of free cash and our expenditures are going down each year. So that's why the growth rate looks so small is because each year we're spending less free cash. And that's the, these numbers are the available revenue that you have to meet, you have to align your expenses with. And the reason it's only going up 0 0.83 is recurring revenue is probably going up 3.2 or whatever, but you're using, you have a lot less free cash in fiscal year 26 to use. So the total revenue can only grow at less than a percent. For other services, you're correct. Right, because instead of having 3.1 in, mm -hmm. in a free cash supplement, you only have one and a half. So you, you've lost $2 million almost off the top. Precisely why there was the concern last year about how much free cash we spent, because we all know it's not sustainable. So we, we had a crisis situation last year. We plugged it with a big infusion of free cash, but that means it's no longer available. Any other sure. comments, Mr. Chair? Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, both Patrice and Jennifer and our finance team and also Dr. Geyser, you and administration and school committee for a rather very thoughtful, detailed analysis that's been presented here. And, you know, clearly it's been said already, these are dramatic reductions on school side and middle school side. It will have an enormously adverse impact on our residents. And, and the other thing that, that you know, as I was listening, Dr. Geiser, to you and to um, our town administrator is, frankly, we're not really even delivering level services today. So it even suggests that this is a, we're going from level services down to a, a no override budget, suggests that we're going to below level services to a no override budget. I mean, that's the sense I'm getting on both, because clearly on the, on the municipal side, we haven't added back the reductions we took in 21. So we, as a board, have always felt that we, we're not delivering, frankly, level services or the services that our residents expect. So, you know, I think our residents need to understand that we're not even delivering the, the level of services you expect. And frankly, we're not even delivering services at a level, at a, at a service that is considered a level, if you will. Um, I had a, just a couple of questions, Dr. Geiser, for you. And, you know, it's helpful to go through all of these really thoughtful um, scenarios, presumably that's been presented to the school committee, but nothing's been voted on between scenario one and two at this point. Correct. And just at a top level, it seems to be a choice, a good choice between <laughs> whether we fund extracurricular activities or instruction. I mean, if I look at the numbers and how they rolled out to get to your reductions, it's a choice between reducing sports and extracurricular activities, arts and some, you know, and music and all of that. And, you know, I don't think we need to detail right now, but that's a, one choice versus do we reduce classroom instruction and increase class sizes? Yes. And, and neither one is, neither one is, neither one is a good choice. Well, and that's why the, that's why I'm going to be bringing a one scenario. Um, what that helped us do is to, so we were sort of up here with the whole tiered structure, right? So what this helped us to do is just start to narrow it down a little bit. 
And then the next step is to bring a one scenario that probably crosses between the scenario, the two scenarios. Um, rather, okay. does Got that it. make sense? So it's sort of- Yeah, so blending it in terms of reductions from gold, but this is just two scenarios that have been outlined. Yeah. One, one additional question in budget summit one or and or two or in the memo that you wrote as well, there was an additional amount beyond this level service number, right? I mean, there was an override, there was an- In the override. Yeah, an override amount. So how much more was that beyond the 66 million? Oh, no. 67 something. No, I think so he's the, discussing the 500. Um, so we had the level services. Okay, from the road. But then there was an additional add to that, about a million or something. About 1.3 million yes. was the one. Point. I was, See, that, that hasn't been presented here, but so so I'm going to assume our override will be successful, and, but we have a lot of work to do. And if we pull it together, I think it can be successful. I really do believe that to be the case. Um, is that something that the schools will continue to consider as something that's needed? You mean in what we presented in that yeah. uh, override? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. I just want clarity on that. So I think what we would need, because obviously with the override number, there may need to be some prioritizing with that FY25 list. So understood. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, understood. So I don't know, yeah. Like we don't know yet what. Yeah. And clearly on the municipal side, there are a number of things that. We've always talked about needing to do that we can't do and haven't done and so i certainly want to think about that as well um and, and just finally i know there are other questions I, I think if we work together collectively here and continue to inform our residents and our community i think we will be successful i think if we have a unified message and i think we're coalescing around that and certainly the board robust amount uh sometime in january I think if we work together and collaborate, we will convince our residents and our taxpayers that this is needed because if not, it's so incredibly damaging to the services um, that we deliver to our residents. No, thank you. Jamal. Can I get some clarity about this 64.29 million for fiscal year 26? Where is that number coming from? The records of revenue, right? So, what Jennifer is going to go through is the revenue allocation that we presented to the Warren Committee and the Select Board. <laughs> it shows how we're getting to the numbers we're getting to. Okay, I guess I guess what I what I was trying to ask before relates to this because basically, do I understand correctly that in a case of uh, no override, what we're targeting for the school is sixty three point seven five million, but for fiscal year twenty six, um, we're we're targeting sixty four point twenty nine. Point twenty nine. That's right. So um, only half a million. When you think about the growth rate, there's no no. You can't expect a growth rate less than four percent for a school. So a, a growth rate, even if it was four percent, you're talking about a two point two million dollars, two point four, two point five million dollars that need to cut from the school alone. So it's true that we don't know exact number, but we know it's going to be more than more than 500,000. We know it's gonna be more than a million. We know it's gonna be more than 2 million. And that is that is really important for the public to really understand that. And the reason I bring this up is that, as we said last time, when, when the school department worked through the cuts up to three and a half million, they struggled to cut anything above the three and a half million. So with the two and a half million that is being, or two point, whatever the number is, 2.7 million that will be cutting, where we're talking between extracurricular instructions, anything above that with an additional 2.4 to $3 million, it's not small pieces. It is, it is really structurally different school that we're talking about. And I feel like we're dancing around this topic a little bit. And I just want to make sure that I name it. It's a huge number that we're talking about this period 26. And there has to be a strategy for a no override so that we are not in a place where we have a no override. We have no 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 way to rescue that in fiscal year 26. Yeah. So, so Jamal, everybody's always 25 was going to be bad and 26 is going to be worse. Uh, I, I think. You're, you're right. Nobody's nobody's assumed anything otherwise because 25, we sort of it's it's a slow fall instead of a crash off a cliff in 25. So it's bad in 25, it's worse in 26, and that's true on the town side as well as the school side. There is no way in a no override scenario to avoid a really bad outcome. That's just the reality. There's not enough money, so it's bad in 25 and it's worse in 26. And I, I think that's just the reality of a no override. So I guess the question becomes, what is the plan for? and no override, what is the plan for the, should the override not pass in April? 
I, I, literally this. Yes. You look at a bad 25 and a worse 26. It's what we're doing. This is the exercise. I apologize. I guess what I was, I was should have asked it differently. What I, what I should be asking is, is the plan to put the override on the ballot again in next next year or the following year? I don't well, think we know that yet. Well, I, I think clearly an override is needed. I think everybody in this room believes an override is needed in April. Uh, and we're, we would like to proceed on that basis. This is all kind of a, a giant backup emergency plan. Um, if an override is not successful in April, uh, it still means that an override is necessary. The question is when. Right. And I think the answer to that really has to await uh, what happens in April because, and really we're getting ahead of ourselves, but uh, I think the choices are sometime uh, Certainly no later than fiscal 26, because we have really uh, no recourse for fiscal 27 at this point to avoid a complete implosion. But I, I think we have to uh, start strategizing in the event the override is not successful in April, when exactly we go back, because it's going to depend a lot on, yeah, I'm reluctant even to speculate on what factors we would take into consideration, but it's, it's clearly, uh, an override is clu clearly necessary. And uh, I think the first priority of the select board, if an override failed in April is to start thinking about um, when to come back to the voters. Yeah, great. Because the one thing that would be, I think even worse is having two failed overrides in succession, particularly in close succession. So, uh, if, it, if it doesn't work out in April, it's going to take a ton of thought. Yeah. Ask a, a related question. Yeah. An override fails in April. The hole for the next override is deeper. Is that accurate? Yeah. yeah. Right. Just as the, in general, the principle is that if the override in April fails, the need for 26 doesn't somehow become smaller. We might have to, we'll be cutting things and that will, de it will depend on all the cutting and the models as Tom was saying, but like, right, it will depend on the base for FY25. But like, it's not like we suddenly need less money to do the same things. I don't know. So yeah, I mean, you're trying to clarify. Yeah, yeah for, two, for two reasons, I'm not a lot of things. Anyway, speak to it. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you're exactly right. For, for two reasons. One, at that point, you fully exhausted the excess free cash or the mitigation free cash that we were using to make the first override smaller. So that's been used to try to plug the holes, the urgent holes. So that's not available to mitigate. And two, while we will try to certainly curtail you know, growth, there continues to be the challenges of growth of expense lines greater than revenue lines. Now we're going to jam them together for a couple of years but you still haven't fundamentally shifted the curve. So in those out years, you're again, looking at a sort of a bigger override than you were, uh, a bigger deficit than you were sort of the previous year. I think the other thing is, even if the board decided to go out to another override, you still have to implement some of the cuts that we've talked about this of course, year, because it's not a guarantee. No question. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Amy, Amy Chuckway, they haven't spoken yet. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think just listening to both of the and thank you for everyone's time putting those together. I, I think um, I was thinking about two different things um, that are related. One is just, um, it feels that um, we are already as a community, um, both on, in terms of school department and the non-school departments, um, working on a very fragile foundation with some probably cracks in it, um, again, that have um, accumulated. And, and um, I know that all of our all of our staff and employees are doing um, so much um, with with so little um, resources available. And again, the override scenario puts forward um, some small, modest um, uh, ways to both close some of those cracks um, and and invest. I think in the future in ways that will um, actually help financially, but also. Um, provide additional services to residents. Um, I think the second thing that um, just uh, speaking as, a, as a, a parent in this community um, that I kept thinking about um, in terms of the school department reductions was um, seeing my own uh, kids in those, in those reductions and what those would have meant 
had my kids, um, or should they go through the school system um, without without those supports academically, without um, opportunities athletically? And I, I know that um, many people in this room have their own uh, you know story and perspective on that. And I believe that um, you know we live in a community that um, that values and wants excellent education. Um, that has been the case for years. I'm also hopeful and appreciative of, of town leadership for supporting an override that hopefully in, includes both, um, again, necessary resources um, to help close some of those cracks, but also to um, start to build, um, you know, I, I think a future that, that folks are expecting. Um, and, and that looks like, um, um, again, core educational services that looks like having athletic opportunities for our kids that looks like having special education supports that are better than they are today. Um, and that also looks like um, uh, services that are not on the um, school side, which I know I sit here as a school committee member, but which I really um, know that many of our residents want and expect. So um, I just, I, I, it, this perhaps echoes some of the comments and I think that um, really sharing sort of the story of what this means, um, what the numbers in these grids mean um, in the coming months um, is going to be um, of critical importance. Um, and um, I am confident that our community will support um, an override. Thank you. All right, Chris, uh, Chris Doyle. Yeah. Um, Chris, you may have to come closer, but microphone is not near you. I can speak loudly, it's okay. So I have sort of a, communi I guess a communication point, which is, it actually builds a little bit on what Amy was saying, but it's a variation, which I would suggest that we have, and maybe this requires like someone from the select board working with the staff and somebody from the search committee with the school administration, because I I fully recognize that everything that was developed here was a massive amount of work for staff on both sides to develop. But I think there are two communication things. One is um, uh, Understandably, a lot of what's described in these cuts is is in sort of budget line item language, which you know everybody here kind of mostly understands. You know this FTE, this line. It was I'm struck at it on both sides, the town side and on the school side. But it doesn't really translate into if you're a student in a school that looks like this, or you're an employee who works in the school, and you probably have, it has to be applied to sort of like an average, some version of the way that we do our property tax bills, which I'm going to bring that up in a second, but an average person with an average value. But, but so an average student, what does that mean? That means they go through the day in the high school with classes that are probably, I don't, I'm guessing 35 people. They have few, these choices. They don't have athletic, you know, just an average person. And then an employee working in the school uh, I don't know, it means they don't have like extra training. They don't have any supplies. They're like putting on a hat to collect. I, just, but I think it's important to translate the line items into what it means for someone. And the same thing on the town side, right? For a town employee, what does it mean to have that budget? And for a town resident, what does it mean? And it, and then likewise, I think it also, you need to have like the average person living in town who say has two kids in the school district, just like we do with a, with a bill, with a tax, you know, somebody has a house and it's worth X dollars amount. When, when we do these overrides, we say, oh, that means the, the average taxpayer in Belmont will pay this much more. Okay, so under this scenario, the average parent in the, in the town who has two kids in school, now they're going to pay X for this and Y for that. So that's on top of you know, there's no override, but this is what they're paying. So people, and then the same thing, a resident, which is someone without people in school, and then a resident who also has people in school. So you're paying for all these fee for services that are being outlined. So sort of translate the line items into what it means uh, for the constituent, you know, the, both the student and the employee, and then the resident and the employee on the town side. I think it's really important to make that next leap. Yeah. Chris. Uh, the reason I'm bringing that up to say someone from the select board and from the school committee is because I recognize that's a lot of work. And so I'm just, and I know that what staff has already done is a massive amount of work. So that's the next step. Well, I, maybe I'd ask uh, Patrice to take a stab at, yeah. at describing this on the town side. So for the town's perspective, it's, it's not, a, it's December 20th. And the last week I've had to inform department heads to inform their staff that they might not have a job. 
that is one of the hardest things to do in my position. So to put this out in a line by line, I felt that it was respectful and given the time of year to hold back and wait to have those discussions a little bit more finite as we get along this process. It, it had to do with more of a cognitive decision that we can, we can discuss the impacts of what it means, but given where we are in this, in this time period in the calendar, I felt it best to just keep it at a higher level and then we'll dig down as we get into a little further. So um, that's, that's why it's, it's, it's I'm not being critical. No, 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 I know. I'm just explaining why it, it, it's not the way it is because it could have been that way, but we decided co unconsciously not to put it out that way. Uh, Matt? Yeah, just one thing I've been thinking about, is, I think implied by this no override is it's gonna really hamper our ability to modernize our town in a lot of the medium to long-term ways that we've been talking about. And I hear people generally agree on, whether it's uh, what Elizabeth Dion and the whole select board have been advocating for in terms of business development, and we need time to have zoning and planning and engineering and community discussions around that stuff. And I look at this, not just the staffing cuts, but our current level of staffing, if we do call it level service on the town side, it seems to really hamper our ability to execute on those things that will determine the multi-decade future of our town. This is, uh, we really have to pass this. Right. Can I, can I speak to that? Because Matt, that's exactly what I was, was thinking about. And I want to step back and say, first of all, thanks to the staff on the town and the school side for typical budget season is one budget. They've had to prepare three. Mm -hmm. They've had to prepare level services. They've had to prepare, you know, an aspirational budget and then a no override budget. So that's, that's three budgets. And the reason that I raised this is I, you know, we, we hear a lot from people who are disgruntled that, that the town or the school potentially is not acting as quickly as they would like on certain things. And I've, I've had to point out they are working around the clock right now. So thank you to everybody for all the work that you've done. And, and please be patient and understand the, the really crushing workload that, that staff are under on, on both sides of this budget. Second thing is we all know um, for whatever reason, Belmont um, opted not to take steps five, 10, 15 years ago that would have put us in a different financial situation. And what this budget discussion does not include is enhancement of revenues outside of an ask on, on taxpayers. The reality is we are deeply committed, and, and I agree, there, there, is, there is agreement across the ideological spectrum in the town as to where we need to go and what we need to do in terms of being more business friendly. Switching from a 95-5 residential commercial property tax base to something that could actually fund, you know, we like to look at our peer communities in terms of what we don't spend versus what they do spend. But what we don't compare is what they collect versus what we don't collect because they made a different set of decisions. And so we are responsible for where we are. But the reality is that we need a bridge. We're gonna to have to ask the voters for a bridge. Um, we are committed to, first of all, doing a market analysis so that we know what is the type of rezoning and development that will give us the biggest bang for our buck. So that is something that the select board will be addressing hopefully the end of next month. Um, at that point, and the planning board's fully on board with this, as are a number of other committees, we are looking at a rewrite of our zoning bylaw and a master plan that hopefully gets us to another place. But I would be lying if I said any of that would be realized before three years. We will be doing really well in three years to have the whole plan solidified. And it's going to take time beyond that. And so the request, part of what this request is of voters is that we need to earn their trust that we actually are going to execute. We have a plan that will execute on it and that eventually it will achieve results, but it's not going to happen quickly. And and if we don't have a bridge, then we do impair our ability. In particular, I am devoted to a robust planning department um, and a robust planning department that can help recruit businesses and build the town that we want, um, just as others are recruited to other robust departments. Um, we really are, and I think this is part of the communication, we are asking the voters for a bridge, for a lifeline, so, so that we can um, realize and then execute on this vision. But also I think that gives them hope that there is a plan. The plan is not simply to keep coming back year after year after year in desperation, that hopefully there will come a point where there is a little more money that's coming, not just from homeowners. Um, Jeff Liberty has his hand up. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, let's go online for a moment. Jeff Liberty, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you, Roy. Um, I really appreciate 
the spirit of what you just shared, Elizabeth, I, I said something similar in a recent meeting, and I think it's something that everybody continues to need to hear from us. Um, I also just want to ask if all of our information about tax relief or deferment is going to be readily available or now or at the time when it comes to vote, because I think that everybody votes individually as a family or as an individual. Um, and so just so knowing what one's options are, if you're a senior or if you are uh, in a tax um, in a in a cash strap position and not really able to pay the additional taxes um, that would be required of you if the override passes. I just hope that all that information is readily available at the same time as the ask, because I think that would motivate people to support something if they knew they didn't have to pay everything right away, uh, if they could pay later, et cetera. So I'm just curious about where that stands. So we've, we've talked to, actually we talked to Aaron um, about uh, things that are happening at the state level in, in regards to in the senior work off program. We're, we're hoping to bring that uh, forward in the spring. Um, so I know there's some other um, initiatives that are out there that we're looking at and we're hoping to kind of move forward. So, so Patrice, just to crisp up your answer, do you think that will all be available and ready to go and to talk about before April? Before April, most likely not. It would be definitely be a placeholder on the warrant by then if there's anything that town meeting needs to do to approve. But, but it's a function of what programs, what different programs are available at the state level. Uh, yeah. The, I think the reality is that the, the um, tax deferral and senior tax um, write-off or credit schemes that are in existence are well explained on the assessor's website. Uh, the basic problem is that uh, as these programs are current currently exists, which is largely a result of legislation at the state level, not very many people are eligible for them. Um, and the, the number of people who take advantage of, say, of the senior tax deferral program right now is uh, quite under, small. Under 15. Uh, I had had a, just to get ahead of myself again, I, I had had a proposal uh, for a, a different approach to uh, senior tax relief that I was hoping to work out with the assessor, but after four years, um, uh, no progress was made, unfortunately. Uh, but I'm hoping that will change uh, in the next year. I think but, one of the things that we need to message about the um, January 22nd special town meeting that's devoted exclusively to uh, switching from a, elected to an appointed board of assessors is it is senior tax relief that is finally driving that. There are other factors as well. It's pilot, but complete inability to move senior tax relief forward was the final straw. And, and if it, it doesn't solve the problem, but it does signal in a very real incredible way that this is something we're aware of, we're concerned about, and we've gone to the final solution that we, we have to go to, to actually do something actionable. Thank you. I just wanted to comment. I, um, I'm, uh, as Patrice mentioned, I'm planning to, to work with the town to try to bring some new tax relief measures forward. But separate from that, I, I, I didn't understand what you just said. Oh, sorry, I have my mask on. Uh, I'm trying to bring new measures to town. There's local option statutes that uh, Jennifer brought to our attention, as well as a couple other programs that I'm hoping we can add to what we have. That said, I respectfully disagree that the uh, town website currently lists and explains the existing programs uh, with any clarity. They're not all listed in one place. Um, the applications are, are difficult to find. Some of them you just have to call, some you just have to email. So I would suggest that streamlining or at least capturing all that information and putting into a single document or single web page, um, as some of our neighboring towns have done, would be really helpful for people. And it would be great just to direct them to them. Ha I'm happy to try to help. It's just, I usually have to call you guys and try not to, I know you have a lot going on. Uh, as you know, I've asked for something and I've withdrawn. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. John. Oh, John. Yeah. Hi, John, U.S. School Committee. Um, first of all, I want to ex express my appreciation for the select board of already voicing a support for a substantial override for the entire town. I think it is important for us to be in agreement and work together to get that way. Um, I have 
two thought. One is very on topic for this meeting, which is on the non-override perspective, where uh, Mark was asking about what is the difference between a scenario. But in reality, we are not choosing between um, extracurricular or curricular. We are already reducing the curricular support significantly. It's the level of curricular reduction, additional curricular reduction weighing against non-curricular reduction in terms of the cuts that we are making. Sure. And I think, and then the second part in the same phase is that similar to the town, we are looking at a 26 level, like uh, Elizabeth said, that it is really drastic. So that in the case of a non-override, what we're likely to see is a more complete restructuring of the school district to that is not going to be what we're seeing now. Um, one, they are out of district placement, which is mandated services. There are no way to re reduce that. And in the sense we're providing less support, we are likely to see higher support, which result in more reduction in regular services. And secondly, uh, we are likely going to have to see things that um, make changes to the entire structure, such as maybe see the high schools go down in terms of the classes they can take instead of six and a half that they take now, maybe it's down to five and a half, uh, or go to a four day school week, or I mean, things that we can't imagine here or Massachusetts won't allow that others are already doing, it is kind of scary. Yeah, we haven't discussed any of those as a- No, we did. It's personal opinion. There. Entirely personal Thank opinion. You. Not fun. You know, we have not discussed any of it, but it is. Um, then um, in terms of talking about the override budget, uh, Mark, you asked in terms of the budget that we have proposed, how much of that is still needed, what we consider to be needed. I believe that uh, Dr. Geiser had put, provided a modest, deliberate, and methodical plan for three-year bridge to the future, just like what we're trying to do with the town that has not saying, I'm going to override, we're going to spend everything in the first year, but planning to rebuild our school program, to enhance our special education program with the intention of reducing our district cost but we cannot project a saving until the, the plan is in place. So similar to a town that we cannot project any revenue until the plan is in place, we are asking the town for a bridge. So, you know, as much as that substantial override can be, it will help our process to save money and not spend all in 25, but have additional, powder to spend on investment in 26 and 27 when the really exciting things are happening. And uh, lastly, looking at the last slide that Patrice has provided for the failed override, it seems like the bigger we go after a fail ride, the more likely that we're going to pass. And hopefully we, if we fail, then we're going back in November with a much bigger one because the town will need it, and more people will have to think that it's necessary. Thank you, Jim. Um, all right, any other comments from the, the assembled committees? I have just a couple small questions. I can either take them offline or I'm happy to ask them now. They may be helpful to others. Well, if they're of general interest, you should ask her. Um, uh, I was just curious, I noticed uh, in the town side presentation, you noted some savings in the benefits, which I assume comes out of the shared services budget. A am I right in assuming that there would be some similar reductions based on the FTEs cut out of the school budget that aren't that we would, in the same way? Is that right? It would affect the, the benefits. Budget. Yeah, so that would, but it's tens of thousands of dollars, not hundreds, right? It's, or maybe, maybe low hundreds. I don't think it's that much. It's not, yeah, but it's not not a game changer. But just curious to know that it might change any a little nudge in there for a time. Okay. But then you have to also remember there's a flip side to that, which is unemployment. Right, of course. <laughs> right, probably all. Is <laughs> um, 
Patrice, I was just wondering uh, specifically. You have a you mentioned in the past in our strategies uh, that we have uh, found efficiencies. And I'm curious, in the past, you've described that as a strategy of attrition where we don't refill positions when people leave. Is that included in the number of FTEs that have already been cut since 2021? Do you have, I think, 5.5? No. So we- Is that a separate? Totally separate. So okay. again, it's my philosophy when, when there's some turnover in a department, you, it's the time to look at the department to see what, what it's needed and what you can potentially do for efficiency. And that usually translates to savings, but then- it kind of flows to the next year and then you don't kind of, you don't see it because you've already captured it. Right. So, so to be specific with the change in the treasurer's office, we reduced yeah. the FTE. The headcount treasurer's office has gone down because of these very significant changes the new treasurer has made since coming in. She's streamlined. It's faster, smarter, better. Right. But so the, the total reduction of FTEs listed uh, as 5.5, right? The actual total headcount change is more than that. Am I right? Okay. Yes. 21. Just checking. Okay. Great. Thank you. Could I, Chris had her hand up. Could I actually but, just ask, um, Tony, could you clarify if any of the, the, the projections for the FY25 include, I know that in F, last year when we were making adjustments, we, were, we collaborated on the benefit savings um, from making some of those adjustments. Yeah, so reductions in a non override scenario for school positions include salary, uh, salary savings, health insurance savings, an offsetting uh, cost than for unemployment. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Marie Warner. Um, related question. Um, we're looking at FTE positions because I know that there has been a continuing challenge in uh, staffing on uh, public safety side and uh, the public uh, on DPW side, et cetera. Can you give us an idea? These are in an override. Are they going to be eliminating those positions or actually people? So that's that's something I'm working on right now. Uh, we're looking at a complete restructure in the Department of Public Works. It has, it involves union negotiations, but we are trying to kind of move some move some things around, which would ultimately result in a, a FTE reduction. But again, it's it's right now we're just we're still working on it. But well, it's not. Uh, Patrice, correct me if I'm wrong. It's not clear that those FTE reductions translate to maintaining the level of service. It's, no. it's just trying to lessen the reduction in service. Uh, Chris Doyle. I just I was wondering whether or not, I know that the January 22nd um, virtual town meeting is dedicated to the, um, uh, the assessor question. I'm wondering if there's gonna be a, um, like an FYI or a town report um, related to the budget. Okay. Well, we will have the budget. I think we need to discuss that with the Yeah, moderator. I mean, we haven't discussed with the moderator yet what the- I think it's a good idea to do something like be, that. But, although, Mike, when, when Mike most recently came before us, he did say any town reports he thought would be appropriate. Right. I think he certainly signaled his, his willingness. It strikes me as, given what we're talking about here, it strikes me as, um, Prudent, but also it's a little bit of like the elephant in the room. If we get together and talk about the assessor and there's like nothing about the budget, it would mm. seem to be a little, it would just break when it's disingenuous. It was unintentional. So. Well, Chris, let's just look at the calendar for a moment because I mean, the, um, this January town meeting was really uh, intended to be a very uh, streamlined, focused, one question kind of town meeting. Um, in terms of other opportunities to discuss the budget, we're going to have really the big one on January 25th. And, um, you know, we could think about another uh, format uh, if there would be the kind of attendance that you'd have at a town meeting. But uh, I think the 25th would be a better setting for that than to um, have a 10 minute report at town meeting where there wouldn't be any discussion. Maybe, maybe both. You can make a presentation and then yeah. you could say there's this meeting where it could be discussed. It might leave more time for comments on the 25th if there were some things. If, if there's, if there's for thought. yeah, it, it's a possibility, but remember, remember anything on the 22nd would be very short and there wouldn't be any debate. So it, yeah. well, they should be a placeholder for at least presenting where we are to date. I think Chris has got a good point and you probably need to do more than just that. There are other things we need to consider for communicating to the 
Yeah. You know, understood. It's just, I feel like it's going to feel really awkward to get together and not talk anything about the budget. Yeah, I think, so, I think, I think awesome. you should talk to the moderator about that. I, I, I think that makes abundant sense, actually, if we can do that. Right. Any other comments from committee committee members? Otherwise, it's... Um, Jeff I think Jeff Lubin has his hand. Oh, Jeff. Sorry. Didn't see. Thank you, Roy. Uh, I, I strongly uh, echo Chris's comments. I think we have to address it to some degree at that meeting. And then I also think we should think about, we can take this offline, is that potentially having a forum that is actually inviting all of town meeting to meet for an educational forum with questions and answers at, at, the, high, at the high school. So something for us to talk about, but I think that is gonna be key uh, to uh, uh, educate. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I don't disagree with any of that, but remember the, um, the, the number is going to be largely set by the end of January. And the purpose of our meeting at the very end of January is really just to formalize it. Then, then the real work begins of explaining it, not just the town meeting, but to the entire community. Because, But we, we will rely on town meeting members as key communicators in each of their neighborhoods and things to educate people around them. Completely agree. That's where I was going with that, is that they are the representatives of their communities, and then they're going to be disseminating that information to their communities. But the, there will be, I, I, I'm confident there will be a vigorous uh, effort from, from January through to the beginning of April to explain why, we're, why this is essential. Uh, yeah. I think though that attendance tonight and just in general, there is meeting fatigue in this town. And I know a lot of town meeting members who have a substantial number of other commitments as well so to say, oh, we're not gonna talk about it at town meeting on the 22nd, because they could come to the thing on the 25th. There's a lot of people who can't do both because they don't have sitters or they don't have the ability or they don't have bandwidth or they have another meeting. So I think town meeting is your opportunity to reach the widest audience of the people who already have a base level of informedness, for lack of a better word. And those are the people you need to hit the ground running. So if you, explain where you're at on January 22nd, they are able to hit the ground running in a much more meaningful way than to hit them with another meeting. There's oh. it, meeting fatigue is huge. See, we, we, we can try. All I want to make clear is that the, the forum on the 22nd is going to be pretty limited in terms of available time and there won't be discussion. So people won't even really be able to ask questions about what they hear. So it's, it, it is what it is, I guess. Uh, all right. Uh, any other questions from committee member, committee members? Otherwise, in our 10 minutes remaining, I take questions from the public. I see Mary Lewis behind the mask there. Uh, I can take the mask off. You don't have to move. Just, just we can hear you with the speak mask loudly enough so okay. speak loudly enough so the microphone picks you up. Right. Well, uh, my name is Mary Lewis. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct One. I want to thank everyone for the extraordinary effort that was put into putting these budgets together, and just want to underscore that um, because we're talking about the no override tonight, we're missing the opportunity cost, the moral cost and the educational cost and the service cost of what we, the potential that we could have had with an override budget. Um, just already as a parent at the high school, my child today had half of his classes canceled due to the fact that we don't even have a building sub. So, you know, we're already cutting into the bone and the idea that we would you know, go to the marrow is really upsetting. So, and I know that's true on the town side too, um, that Patrice has done all kinds of things to try and make the town more efficient. So have the schools. Um, so I just wanted to underscore that, you know, we're already at a below, and I think Mark said this too, a below level services budget and that if we don't work together, come together as a town of all generations um, to work toward that bridge to the future that Elizabeth was just talking about and Joan was just talking about, then you know we, this really won't be the same town anymore. So I just want to encourage 
the communication that Chris Doyle was asking us to engage in, the communication at town meeting, I think it's an excellent idea, even if it's only a 10 minute presentation of kind of a global view. Um, and really everyone who's listening to get informed, to ask questions, to learn about the override committee, um, which you can do by going to investinbelmont.com. Um, I hope that's okay that I mentioned that here. And um, yeah, just learn more because this is your town and you need to fight for it. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. All right. Um, any other comments from the public? Please raise your Zoom hand if you would like to say something. Uh, well, I don't see any hands. I think we've overwhelmed them with their hands. <laughs> yeah. We did it. Yeah, we, we had such a great one in the back. Yeah, the oh, part. sorry. Oh, why am I? Angus Abercrombie, town meeting member, precinct eight. I, I've talked to a lot of people in this town. It's something I enjoy doing. Um, and one of the overwhelming things that you hear when you are asking people to support the override is a level of distrust and apathy with towards town staff or school staff because of experiences. And when people tell me the stories of not getting a phone call returned, I, I have to push back and say that that is because of where we are, because of the cuts that we have made over, you know, decades and i think it is going to be really important to frame this as, as a as a conversation about hope and a conversation about you know building what it's going to take to put belmont on a, a fiscal path that is healthy that is you know safe for our seniors and, and lower income people to be a part of this community and and stable in the long term is to put this one forward and, and, and move in that direction. And I think the cuts demonstrated here and presented here tonight are terrifying. I mean, I, I, I went through a classroom two years ago and the changes that I'm seeing here, and that's not even well detailed for FY26. I, I am terrified for what our students are gonna be going through. And I think that that is only going to do so much. That terror, it does get people out and it does get them to vote. But what gets people to really come together in this community is hope. And so I just, I hope we can stay hopeful and I hope we can continue to, to talk about the path, the investments, and where we will be in three years and five years and in 10 years if we pass this. Uh, and you know, those are the budgets that I'm I'm very excited to see. Thank you, Angus. Uh, <clears throat> any other comments? Well, 55. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, all right. We, we Mark, <laughs> make, Mark makes a good <laughs> we, we, we wish everybody happy holidays. Happy holidays. <laughs> happy New Year. And, you know, I think I think what's important, though, is I said before, um, I, I agree with what Angus says. It's good. Hope's a good thing. Right. So I think that um, I'm hopeful because I think we have a lot of smart people around the table here. And I know that we can work together, deliver the message that's needed to be delivered to the community. Successful overrides. Holidays. Hey, uh, do you motion to adjourn? We, we do. To adjourn? Second. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. So we didn't need to do that. Well, separate committees. And have us. The Warren Committee meeting. The Warren Committee. Warren Committee. Bob and Bluff. Aye. Delighted. Adjourning the Warren Committee. Aye. Hi. Aye. Motion to adjourn the the Capital Budget Committee conference the Capital Budget Committee. Second. Yes. Aye. Aye. To adjourn the school. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thanks, Jeff. All right, thank you, everybody. Nice.
How are you, Chris? Good. Nice to see you.